Welcome to Live Doctors, everyone. This is Dr. Andrew David Schiller. We're talking about multiple sclerosis today. We have a very special guest, Dr. Mark Freeman. He is the director of the Multiple Sclerosis Research and Clinical Unit at Ottawa Hospital. He's also professor of medicine at Ottawa University. That's University of Ottawa, excuse me. He's also a senior scientist at the Ottawa Hospital uh, Clinical Research Unit Institute. Uh, he's had more than 250 publications, articles, book chapters, uh, presentations, etc., in the field of neuroscience, I mean, multiple sclerosis research. So he's really an expert internationally in multiple sclerosis. It's a pleasure to have him here with us today. So please, here we are, Dr. Freeman. Thanks for coming and being with us. Thanks, David. So we're going to be talking about multiple sclerosis, and to our lay audience at home, uh, tell us a little bit, what is multiple sclerosis and what causes it? <laughs> the, the, the magic question. Uh, well, you know, this is a disease that was described uh, probably 150 years ago when they first saw the pathology, uh, brought to light really by a French neurologist, uh, Charcot, who uh, uh, really outlines the pathology and noticed all these scars, the sclerose en black, these scars in the nervous system. And that's how it got its name. Uh, and then over the years, people started recognizing the symptoms of multiple sclerosis, uh, which are so varied and, and different in almost everyone. So although we have thousands of patients that we look after with MS, uh, if people ask me, what sort of patients do you have? And I say, well, I have, if I have 5,000 patients, I have 5,000 different MS cases because it's so unique. Everyone has their own sort of twist to the disease. Uh, neurologists being what we are, we tend to describe things over years, uh, the pattern of, of how they behave, and so th there's been certain courses that have been defined, such as relapsing, remitting, or progressive, and, uh, and patients always ask me, what kind do I have? And I say, well, you know, to be honest, if I took a piece of your tissue and showed it to a pathologist, they wouldn't be able to tell me what kind of course you had. And, and if we take the pictures of your brain by MRI and I showed it to the, the world's expert neuroradiologist in MS and said, what kind of course is this? No clue. So the pathology is sort of the same uh, and the pattern of expression is unique. What causes it is really an enigma. And I think the, the story is really true for all autoimmune disease. There's the, the usual story that uh, genes sort of load the gun, so to speak, uh, and, and there are certain genetic makeups that are more prone to developing autoimmune disease. Uh, people know other autoimmune diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, for instance, or lupus, or even thyroid disease, juvenile diabetes, the list goes on. Ba basically, every organ system has an autoimmune disease associated with it. Uh, so what is that? That's, your immune system is put on board to protect you. Uh, and, and, and actually has three major functions. Obviously, the, the, the army is there to defend you against invasion from without, so uh, or, you know, organisms, uh, infections and such, uh, from invasion within, transformation, cancer, and the like. And, and we live with many viruses, and so viruses that normally are dormant within us and then decide not to be, like herpes, uh, they'll take care of that. And then the one... Thing that everyone forgets about. The immune system is there to repair. And without it, you'll never heal. You know, when you cut yourself, first thing that happens, it gets inflamed, right? So your immune system is there to defend you and to repair you. Uh, but sometimes it makes a mistake. Uh, exactly what the mistake is in MS or, or Crohn's disease or any of the autoimmune diseases I've known, it's, it's, it's thought to be a trigger, usually implicated our viruses. And then somehow the immune system thinks it's going after the enemy, but recognizes maybe something that's similar on, uh, in the case of multiple sclerosis, the myelin, the insulation of the wires in the central nervous system. And it trips up thinking it's attacking uh, uh, an invader, but in fact the little component of myelin is natural. And as soon as the immune system is triggered to do something, it never stops. It's, it's, it's like, you know, one, one way ticket. It's, it's got a mission and the mission is to wipe out the myelin. And so this becomes a chronic disease. Who gets multiple sclerosis? Are there particular profile, age groups, gender, racial differences? 
national All of those holidays. things. <laughs> All of those yeah. things. Yeah. Anyone can get it. We've had children uh, and we've had oh. seniors all present with their first attack of MS. It, it, the, the typical picture uh, for most autoimmune diseases is more women than men, and, and uh, usually about two to one. And usually it's the you know, 20s to 30s for the females, maybe a little older for the males that get MS. Um, it was described uh, mostly in a Caucasian population years ago. Uh, the genetic roots of this probably can be traced back to northern Scotland and Scandinavia in particular. Uh, and then the diaspora of, of all that gene pool and where they've gone around the world, it, it's seen everywhere. They're, there's, they're in Chinese, they're in Japanese, but there are some groups that are almost, would be a rarity to see it. Uh, for instance, uh, up in Lapland in, in Finland, never been a case of multiple sclerosis described. In Canada, where I'm from, the Eskimos would rarely get it. But, but there's been so much mixing of genes over the years. So it sounds like what you're saying is that a broad swath of humanity can get MS, the genetics aren't really so specific, uh, and it really can hit anybody. And um, let's talk a bit more about diagnosis and what MS shows up as, because what you were describing before was a lot of different symptoms. And my understanding is that it can show up in lots of different ways. So are there symptoms that are most concerning that a person should think about, wow, I should get myself checked out. Do I have MS? Uh, I, I almost don't want to answer that question because it's just going to create such neuroses in, in, uh -huh. in people. Uh -huh. uh, but virtually any symptom neurological uh -huh. could be a, a manifestation of multiple sclerosis. Okay. Typically, uh, most patients will present when uh, the disease attacks what we call an eloquent area. So it's pretty hard to hide a, a, a plaque in your optic nerve. Yeah. And that when shows you go up. blind in one eye, ah. you're gonna say, hey, hey, there's something wrong here, I can't see. Right. You're gonna go see the eye doctor. Uh, when you put a plaque in the spinal cord, Usually it, it causes problems walking, you get numbness in your legs, you, you might lose bladder function. You're not going to let that go. You're usually going to seek attention for it. It doesn't happen like that. And that's important, for a distinction from, say, stroke, which does happen like that. Uh, if you have sudden onset of symptoms, this is something that uh, is more serious and then that, that's usually typical of stroke. But if they're slowly evolving, usually over days, you're looking at what we call demyelination, the de-insulation of these wires. And just like you can imagine stripping a wire that you got plugged in somewhere, it's not going to conduct as well, and it may short out initially and then maybe cut out completely. So the symptoms are wherever the nervous system is. It controls all of us. So in other words, because the underlying pathology, the cause of MS, is this autoimmune demyelination, removal of the insulation of the nerves, it could show up in any kind of system of the body, any kind of neurologic system. Pretty well. I hear that. Um, One of the ones that is subtle that people don't realize uh, is the, uh, well, are the cognitive changes. Uh -huh. and, and we, even after one episode of, say, optic neuritis where you don't see, the studies that we've done on patients who've had just a single episode indicate to us that, uh, and of course the MRI tells us they've had stuff going on long before that, um, that they're having cognitive issues that predate and uh, the onset of this, say, blindness. And at the same time, if you compared them uh, cognitively to an age match control and even educated match control, uh, they don't do as well. So you can have uh, a presentation in a young adult of dementia. And, and, and MS should be in the differential. Hmm. And so how does a doctor diagnose MS? How do we know when someone does or does not have an MS? And if, if there are controversies or challenges in that? Oh, there's you know, this is medicine, isn't it? So there's controversies in everything. But uh, we've developed diagnostic criteria. Uh, and, and you'll notice that diagnostic criteria apply to a lot of autoimmune diseases today. Why do we need these? Uh, and it's because the autoimmune diseases can be so elusive that one has to have a constellation of symptoms and signs, and then you're more sure of the diagnosis. 
Well, medicine is really a process of eliminating other potential causes that sometimes are more serious and sometimes more treatable or easily treatable. So we go through this little rigmarole of getting rid of uh, things that might look like MS that are more obvious, that are easily treatable, and you don't want to miss. So those are the things that we do. Is uh, the, People ask, why do you do so many tests? Is it a test for MS? There is no test for MS. It's a clinical diagnosis based on the uh, history and the uh, constellation of signs and symptoms that uh, belie this disorder. We do the tests to eliminate other possibilities. At the same time, some tests give us some indication of not only that you have MS, but uh, perhaps the prognostic. And so typically we will look for signs of demyelination, the deinsulation of the wires in the central nervous system by an MRI. And if the MRI is perfectly normal, we really have to question the diagnosis. But the MRI sometimes shows us other things, things that could look like MS. And we go, aha. Mm. So that's the importance of the imaging. That's the morphology of the disease. I see. There are certain things we can't image routinely. For instance, the optic nerves, not an easy thing to image. The spinal cord we can image, but it's, it's you know, it's harder to do as it goes through the body. And it's a much longer scan, and the uh, uh, definition is so uh, poor because you're taking a picture of the whole body. And so we do other measures to look at uh, the optic nerves and spinal cord. The optic nerves, we can measure uh, a neurophysiological signal that gets we flash things to the eye, and we can measure it in the brain. And then finally, one of the things that uh, the hallmarks of disease is, is the presence of inflammation. So we can pick up inflammation with dye in the MRI, but it's a hit and miss 50-50 chance that you might see the inflammation with the dye. So now when you say dye in the MRI, is that contrast? It's yeah, contrast dye. Is that for gadolinium? MRI. or is Gadolinium, that yeah, and all of the different types of gadolinium right. that are being used. Okay. But not all lesions will pick up gadolinium. Uh -huh. So if you don't have it, does that mean you don't have inflammation? The answer is no, you can still have lots of inflammation. And so we want to do a spinal tap. The spinal tap is to look at the fluid. The fluid contains all the signs of this inflammation. If you've got a urinary tract infection, we're not going to diagnose it looking at your blood. We're going to diagnose it looking at your urine. If you've got a brain inflammation, get the fluid that bathes the brain and you have an indication of what uh, is going on there. And uh, sometimes you get red flags, you see things that are not typical, and you go, oh, you know, it might be MS, but maybe it could be this other thing. And if it's this other thing, that's much more worrisome. So we like to do the spinal fluid. It sort of completes the picture. Right. Let's talk about treatment. I mean, if you could give our audience an overview of treatment for MS. So I, I like to divide treatment into two categories. Uh, one is the uh, treatment of the disease itself. And, and uh, when I got in this business, we had nothing. There was nothing that would alter the natural course of the disease. Uh, so we weren't talking about that. And over the last couple of decades, now we have a big tool chest and it continues to grow over time. We get newer medications that will change the natural course of the disease. I'll come back to that. The day-to-day -day symptoms, that's what patients really want. They have all sorts of issues. And some of these we can treat, and some of them we acknowledge we cannot. Um, we're doctors, right? Our, our tools are mostly medications, medications that we take, or uh, treatments that we can apply, physical treatments that we can apply. Um, but beyond that, we don't really have any magic. People want to know about diet and exercise and acupuncture and you know, our part of the world, cannabis and, you know, the, all, all the so-called natural things. Um, the science hasn't really given us any evidence that these things clearly make a difference. But you have to stay healthy, right? There's the rest of you that you have to worry about. And uh, a healthy body uh, is, is so important. Uh, in the last couple of years, we've talked about things called comorbidities. So it's a fancy name for what other problems the body may have to have. And so a person who's overweight, who smokes, who doesn't sleep well, who doesn't exercise, who may have heart disease, diabetes, thyroid, you name it, 
is going to, their MS is going to do much worse. And this is now proven. So when we think about the treatments, you think about not just the brain and spinal cord and optic uh -huh. nerves, think about the whole body. Uh -huh, interesting. And, and, and treatment has to sort of be geared to all of that. So in other words, um, you're trying to treat the whole person, essentially. Yes. And if they have other illnesses, get those under control because they do better if the illness are under control. Absolutely. And if they have stress or if they're sedentary, then getting that stuff tuned up actually helps the person with MS do and, better. And, and now we're recognizing it helps all autoimmune diseases, not just MS. Mm. Uh, and, and this is becoming a science. People have put these through clinical trials, patients who exercise who don't, who are overweight who are not, who smoke who don't. And all of these things can affect it. So these are the things that patients can do and need to be empowered to do and need to be encouraged to do because that will change the disease for them without the drugs. Fortunately, we do have therapies that will work. Uh, some of the symptoms can be treated better than others. For instance, we are getting much better at treating bladder problems, uh, whereas we are nowhere uh, in the treatment of the coordination difficulties that some patients will have. There's some measures that you can take from a rehabilitation standpoint that will reduce the impact of that, but we can't fix it. Let's, let's face it. Um, some patients have pain. We have to deal with the pain. I wish we could enhance cognitive powers. Same thing is holding true with all diseases that affect cognition. This is where all these now internet games come out. You know, train your mind, exercise your mind, you'll feel better. You know, this is all very good for the general well-being for patients. Fortunately, we do have medications and treatments that will alter the natural history. Uh, these have been evolving since the late 80s. Uh, the injectable therapies that have been around for decades and, and uh, they're important because they do work in the majority of patients for at least some time. Uh, people hate having to inject them but that's the only way they work and they're safe. We have not seen from the so-called immunomodulators really any dangerous signals going out decades from people taking it. If I'm understanding you correctly, the immunomodulators, after decades of experience, they don't have any particular side effects, say, like other kinds of chemotherapy or Correct. things like that. So, so if they're controlling the MS for a person, we're not seeing bad long-term side effects from that. Right. I, I'm going to use terms like modulate. What does that mean? So yeah. most people don't know what modulation is. Right. Remember the three functions of the immune system, right? Protect from invasion without and within and repair. It's also clear that the immune system is doing something wrong in chewing up the myelin and causing MS. So how do we deal with that aspect but leave the other intact? Because you still want a functioning immune system. We call this an immunocompetent system, something that will work but not attack the central nervous system. It's a balance. So that's where the modulators have come in because for the most part, they have reduced the attack on the central nervous system and spared the ability of the immune system to still do these other things, right? And some patients, their disease exceeds the ability of these modulators to do it. So you have to pull out stronger therapies. Right, right. The therapies are stronger, but so they're going to compromise. Be, be, before we go to that for a second, so what I'm hearing is that... The, um, there's one basic piece which is helping the person be healthier. Another piece which is dealing and with... And feel better. And feel better. And then dealing with, with the complications, whether it be cognitive or sensory or motor, and helping them function better. And then you're talking about the immuno, immunomodulators which affect the natural course. So I'm not sure we've defined that so well for our audience because MS, as many people understand, kind of comes and goes. So well, that's actually, you know, they appreciate... That's not. You speak to the average MS patient, they're going to tell you it never goes. Ah, uh, okay. And those symptoms are there every day. Right. What we're talking about coming and going are the exacerbations where there's a tendency for it to get much worse and then tend to improve, at least in one form of the illness. And now when you say getting much worse and improving, you're talking about the inflammation and damage? You're talking yeah. about the symptoms or both? No, no, no. The, the focal damage that occurs uh -huh. that escalates at times I for see. whatever reason and leads to what we call attacks, where patients can get 
from not seeing to you know to seeing to not seeing again to seeing double and then improving to not walking and improving the symptoms can be quite acute over days and quite disabling and then they improve again so those are the attacks and that's what we're trying to cut down on because that's big pockets of inflammation that have affected certain parts of the brain so now in light of that explanation changing the course of disease with immunomodulators what does that mean exactly well those types of attacks are either uh, reduced substantially in number but also severity mm -hmm. so instead of having total paralysis below the legs you might have a little weakness of a foot for a few days easier to recover from than total paralysis right so the immunomodulators lessen they reduce the attacks they reduce the inflammation. We've seen that from MRI studies. And all of that is expected to translate into less accumulated damage. And it's the accumulated damage, which when it exceeds a certain threshold, which will be different in every individual, trips the patient into now a more progressive course, which is really a reflection of the accumulated damage over many years plus aging. So now, earlier you were saying that the mainstay of treatment is the immuno immunomodulators because they've got a great history. Uh, some people don't respond to them and you need to use stronger measures. What percentage of people, do we have a good handle on that, of what percentage of people do respond to the immunomodulators versus the percentage that needs stronger treatment? Well, that's a whole, you, you've just raised a whole big question about uh, how do you define response? Uh, which is difficult to get into. Um, I, I like to think of respond. There's there's two types of responders: true responders and false responders. What's a false responder? Take a patient group today, put them in a placebo-controlled study. You follow them for a couple of years. Interestingly, 20, 30, even 40 percent of the placebo. These are patients taking nothing. They don't have any attacks, they don't have any new MRI lesions, they show no evidence of progression. If they were on a therapy, you would say, oh, see, that's a wonderful therapy. They're a false responder, because you're measuring response by the lack of development of new things. But we don't know what the natural history is for any given individual. Maybe it would be three years before they got an attack. So that's the false responder, and we have to always keep in mind that that's a group that we, we don't know. The true responder is someone who's not having all those events because you picked the right medicine for them. Great, but you can't tell the difference from it. Non-responder, is there a cure? Are any of the medicines that we have curative? Can you cure diabetes? No, you can control diabetes. Can you cure hypertension? You can control hypertension. So there are going to be some people who are going to have some kind of disease activity. And if what you're looking for from the treatment for MS is zero, that's the cure. Well, you know, we can do that, actually, in extreme cases. But for the most part, uh, the therapies are, are aimed at minimizing the development of new activity. And we have to define the limit. And then if you exceed that limit, you're a non-responder, okay? So and that, so this is where you use some of the other therapies. Okay, so briefly, if you, we, we've talked about how some people don't respond to immunomodular agents, the common ones like Copaxone and Avonex. Um, the stronger therapies that you talked about for people who are not responding, who are breaking through that, can you tell us just a brief picture of what that looks like? Well, well, each of these drugs that have been developed, first of all, very few of them have been tested mm -hmm. to show that they're actually stronger. What, when we talk about escalating therapy for patients, we're really talking about using drugs that have the potential of causing more concern. Mm -hmm. So why expose yourself to an agent that may kill you in some cases or um, develop lifelong problems as a result of taking that medicine? if you don't need it. So if the modulators are, are working for us, we hold the course, even if they might be inconvenient. If they're not, you move to some of the other medicines that we have that work differently, but bring to the table some new problems. You have to, it's benefit and risk, right? So is it worth taking those drugs in an effort to try to control the disease? Well, sure.
I mean, if this disease is escalating and what we're seeing is early disability coming on, and you're talking about a young person in the throes of their career, this is not an opportune time to become disabled. They're going to become more desperate and they're going to use these therapies. So the question comes, if you're going to use it, are you stuck on those for the rest of your life? We don't think so, just like we do with other diseases. We, we try to pick something that a patient can stay on. And if the disease escalates, think of Crohn's, think of rheumatoid, you add these medications. Well, we haven't been able to do that in MS. And you know what the one, number one reason is why? Mm. The drugs are so costly today, we recognize that, that although it might be in the best interests for patients to actually combine therapies, we have not been able to do that in MS simply because of the cost. But I see this coming as uh, some of the immunomodulators are going to become generic. We will be able to start combining medicines and, and uh, uh, it's the combination of medicines that have really made a difference in so many other diseases. This is the future for MS. Are there other things as, as we go forward that we can see on the horizon in terms of care of MS, treatment of MS? Um, I mean, the field is probably in neurology the most uh, exciting and explosive field. Uh, we're, we're expecting probably three new therapies in the next year. They're sitting waiting for approval with uh, uh, like the FDA. So uh, and at our particular site, we're running over 30 different trials. There's, it's a never-ending battle to try to find the right therapy for the right patient. And, uh, and that is leading us down many different roads. We're uncovering new clues about what uh, keeps MS going. And as we un uncover those clues, we develop specific therapies for those clues. And for the right person, that might be the answer. Um, and because there's so many different types of MS, we need many different types of medications to address those many types, and I think we're, we're getting there. Very interesting. Any other final comments you'd have for our audience at home or our viewers? I used to tell people, uh, when, I, when I got in the field, you're going to be surprised at this because you're a bit younger. I would see a young woman had optic neuritis, numbness of her feet, and I would, as a eager beaver neurology resident say, oh, I think this is multiple sclerosis. So my uh, mentor would say to me, my staff, don't tell her. Just tell her she has a little inflammation of her nervous system, it'll get better. What, what, don't tell her she has MS? Why would you bother? We don't have any treatments for it. Why get her all upset? Don't tell her. That was the attitude in the 80s. Can you believe that? Today, we can control MS. If we catch it early and we treat it effectively early, I think most patients can be guaranteed a pretty good life. Leave it until the damage accumulates. We don't have those tools. We're gaining them. In the last year, we've seen two medications finally break into the progressive MS world and make a difference. And we've never been able to break that ice before. So. Are now into treating progressive MS. We're, I think, really moving. Sounds like progress is happening. It's very encouraging, and we really appreciate you coming and speaking with us today. This has been Dr. Mark Freeman, uh, professor of neurology at Ottawa Hospital, Ottawa University, University, University of, Ottawa. of Ottawa. And uh, thanks very much for your time, and uh, all the best to you. Thank you.